it and let me entertain you. Let's have a look at the giveaway so I don't forget. All right. I'm giving this away today, guys, and I'm giving it away exclusively to an anatomy of style student. OK, now what I did was I spun the dial. I couldn't get the little dog to do it because there's been a lot of students. So and he would have been just so fat because what I used what I did the first time is put a little treat next to everyone's names and he would go in and snuffle them up. And whatever one he went to first got the got the prize. So he would have been just eating that stuff all day. So I spun the dial. And there was a lot there was a lot of anatomy of style students. Well, a few anatomy of style students have come back a couple of times. Like uh, like Chuck and Rachel and Melanie came back a couple of times. So their names come up more. So it was a bit like uh, Lotto. You buy more tickets. You know, there's more. Look at me. I sounds like a sprook, doesn't it? Buy more tickets and you've got more chances to win. But it was kind of like that. I saw the names fly past. Anyway. I did it blind, closed my eyes, did a click, and up came a name. So that's already been sorted, and we'll reveal that at the end, the big reveal. Okay, so let's go in. So welcome, everyone, if there's anyone there. Is there anyone in the chat there, Rachel, Melanie? Uh, we had a handful of people. We already uh, we have a question, too. I have a question already. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, someone was, someone was waiting. Um, Achilles777 uh, says, hey, Patrick, I have a question. I've always liked Frank Pozzetta's use of light. I heard someone once say that he used a combination of stage lighting and spotlighting. Is yes. that true? And what does that mean? <laughs> well, what is the truth? The truth is still just in Frank's head, but I believe he did. I believe he did that. So let's have a look at Frank and we'll, we'll soon sort it out. So in the photos, oh, I dread, I should have checked. This is what we were supposed to do. We were sitting just shooting the breeze and I'm supposed to be checking for bugs. And I'm terrified to open this in case my text records fly up on screen. So uh, let's have a look for Zeta. Everything looks fine. Let's look at a Frank for Zeta piece. So good question. Who was that again, Rachel? Did I ask uh, that? Achilles 777. Achilles, reveal yourself. <laughs> Achilles 5777. That's not on your birth certificate. Who are you? It's not your that's, real name. That's me. not, I don't believe it might be. You never know. Might be San Francisco, kid. There's some crazy names out there. Purple rainbows. It's all in there. Let's have a look at this and see. Uh, yeah. So have a look at this. So what it means by, so for the first part of the question, you used stage uh, composition, was it? And spotlighting? Or was it stage lighting and spotlighting? Stage lighting and spotlighting. Yeah. What it is, I think he used, can I bring this in? Let's, let's edit with. Photoshop. So think of this like our class is, like a symposium. I'm sorry, guys. Welcome, everyone, to my alumni students here, Anatomy of Style students. Check the link below to see their work. They're amazing. And they've been with me for a while. Laura's quite um, new in the, in the shop. But over time, I, you know, I'm growing this, this art community. Well, we're all growing it. Look at me taking all the credit. In fact, I'm, I'm doing practically nothing. <laughs> I just made a... I just made a Discord chat room and it grew itself with the, um, you know, with the energy of you guys, not so much me and I pop in, but I'm going to try now. My, my quest now is to grow that community and post on YouTube at least once a month and keep coming back to it. That's my quest. That's my quest. So I want everyone involved. And you know what I was thinking, guys, in the, in the chat room? Tell me what you think. I was thinking of making... Because I'm getting a bit bold now. On the side, you can make new sort of rooms. I was thinking of making a room that was something like, where are you in the world? And I would be Patrick in Brisbane, and I would show a little bit of Brisbane. I was thinking that. Is that, is that too smelty? And then everyone would say, I'm from Mexico. Here's where I live. Is that too smelty? Tell me the truth. I can take it. I don't think That's so, cool. but I, I don't know what smelty means. <laughs> Well, it means like, <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 okay, okay. Yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's great because I know we've got in the in the Discord at least we got somebody from from South Africa, and I like w once they sent me a photo, and I had to like figure out where they were from like the cafe they were in. Uh, so it's always oh, cool. That is interesting. Oh, that's that. cool. I like that. I like yeah, that. You have, you have an international fan base. Yeah, well, we got well. Most of them are in Texas, so uh, you know, I'd get. Um, it'd be funny to see everyone in Texas together. <laughs> we just put the fan in there. And the yeah. what would be the what would be the center of action, Chuck? 
and Texas. If everyone was to say, I'll I'm meet you somewhere. Dallas, I think, but Dallas is lame. Yeah. Sorry. Is it late? Oh, Chuck, I tell you, you're walking <laughs> the tightrope over there. Every time I come on, every time I come on to your podcast, I there's a there's a hesitation. It's not because I'm an android. It's because I'm going, don't say what the first thing you're going to think. Don't say the first thing you're going to think. Now speak. That's what I think every single time because I get in so much trouble. Like when look, I nearly repeated it. Don't say what you're going to think first. I'll sit down. Yeah. So there's a time when someone says to me, what do you think of? And I says, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And the vitriol all the way, Don, all the way for what I said. He says, look, if it helps you guys, that's fine. I got all curled up in a little ball. He says, okay, please, sir, don't beat me anymore. I was a bit like that. And I was right. I was right. Two months later, all crying, all going, I didn't see that coming. I said, well, I didn't really. I just said in my head, well, I did I'll give you fair warning for it. So there's a little bit of, um, I got a little bit of uh, old school um, wisdom, a little bit of old school wisdom. But what I want is new school uh, wisdom too. And I want to create a podcast as well with, you know, new thinkers where I'm just the grand old guy in the corner going, I don't think it'll fly. And they'll go, oh, shut up, grandpa. You don't know what's coming. Uh, you know, it's a roller coaster and you better be on it. That, that kind of thing. So I want to get that podcast going. I've got a whole bunch of ideas for it. So I'm hanging out. I wonder if any of the homies hang out are with me. So the, I'm hanging out with these guys, the homie hangouts, and they're great minds. I'm going to do a podcast with them. In fact, Rachel, ask in the in the chat, would you, or look in the chat, and I'll ask it. Are there any homie hangouts in the chat? Homie hangouts? Homie hangouts. I invited them in today, if they could make it. It's a last-minute invite. Reveal yourselves. I think it might be the Achilles. Reveal I, I've spotted your Achilles heel. Uh, um, apparently, uh... On the a live stream, you can't really see Chuck, by the way, because he's on the top right corner. But if you like, scoot, yeah, we got to see, can... see Chuck. We yeah, need the I... glamour. We need the glamour. <laughs> oh, but, well, we got the glamour. We got the glamour at the bottom, and then we it gets a little bug, bit ugly in the middle, and then we want the you know the, wow. the meal. Hold on, I'm in the middle, right? <laughs> Just in case you're seeing different, <laughs> maybe you might be seeing a different screen. So I'm the ugly in the middle, and then we got the hands for the top. So let's let's see why we can't see Chuck. The people have spoken, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Gallery. It should Chuck should be there. Really, Chuck's not at the top still. Oh, we've uh, got Chuck just a little cut off. Chuck, if yeah. you just go like this. Oh, he's, oh, if he's cut off. Well, I might drop him down like that. Yeah, it's see? just that's all you gotta do. <laughs> oh, it's, I get it. I know what it is. It's a 16 by 9 ratio. So Patrick's got his big fancy screen. It's really wide. <laughs> it's wider than YouTube. And that's what I, I can see more. So I think maybe Frank Frazetta might be a bit cut off at the top too. I'm going to make a white line. Rachel, tell me if you can see the- Oh, Nelly it's just the, that top right corner. Yeah. If you just stay out of that, you'll be fine. Oh, it's yeah. only that. It's fixed. It's only yeah, that. you're good now. Good. So yeah. if I do this white line here, you can see it. Yeah, I can see that. It's just, uh, there's like a little extra window in the top right there on the live stream that, that shows oh, whoever's right. talking. It pops up there. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, I see. So I jump up to the top and then you jump up to the top. Is that what, what happens? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I just thought I'd point out that Chuck was cut off there. Oh, all right. <laughs> For a second. That was solid. Thank you. You can sit back up, Chuck. All right. So back to <laughs> look at us. We're not even are we live? Yes, we are. Uh, yeah. So yes, I would say <laughs> that Frank Frazetti used two things. I would say he used um more one stage composition. Stage comp, we'll make it small. And and I, I think he used theater light. Light. So the theater light would be, there's a spotlight. So just imagine that all these guys are up here working the lights up in the boom section. And that's what the spotlight's on. And then way back in here in the background, we get that lovely foggy sfumato. Now, we've been together a while, so I'm just going to reiterate these things as we go for any beginner students coming in. So, spumato means smoke. And it was the first time used, well, that we can look back in history for and say, look at the marvel of spumato in the Mona Lisa, where we saw soft edges. Like, for instance, there's a bit of spumato there. 
Now, before that, it was all church windows. Everything was clear cut. You could see every toe, everything. And it was it was a bit like going to a shopping center. All the lights are on. Everyone's trying to get you to buy stuff and you get a headache because you don't know where to look. Everything's just fine for attention. And Spumato stopped that. And basically, Leonardo was composing with light and with perspective distance, with perspective atmosphere. So you see a distance by seeing less. And when you see everything, there's no distance. Everything's right here. And it's really overwhelming. It's I went to see a 3D movie at the IMAX once. I just had to get out because it was uh, King Tut's tomb. They take you to the tomb. And it was just these walls like that. I couldn't breathe. I thought I'm never getting out of this tomb. So everything's quite psychological. You can close your eyes and you're fine. Uh, so that's it. It's a 2D surface with great drama and wonderful technique. And then technique disappears because Frank then uses his powers of seduction and color and story. And why is he so brilliant? All of those things. But we could break it down to these two things. And the reason it's a theater composition is you can imagine here, everyone watching the show down here at the bottom, because there's the perspective. The perspective is right there on that eye view going up, all the way up. Suppose up in the peanut gallery, you'd still have people up in the back seeing this perspective here. But basically what we're doing is we're looking up on a stage straight ahead and our eye goes back and forth and there's no perspective this way. There's no perspective that way. It's all in there. And of course, look what that does. You can't take your eye out of the picture and you can't take your eye away from that focus right there, which is this. And this is this. Now, you might say, what a little old hokey, Patrick, you made all that up on the spot. I don't think so. I really believe that. I believe that's what he did. I think that's what it is. I'm looking now, right now, at a dramatic stage show, and I have the best view in the house. I've got the prime seat. I'm the president of Venezuela, and I've been invited, and I've got all my medals here, and I'm watching the show from the best vantage point you can possibly get. So we were treated like presidents of countries, going, you got, you got the best seat, no obstruction, nobody's big stupid head or ears are in your way. There's the story. Get totally involved. That's what I believe. One thing I've noticed, Patrick, with, with Frazetta, especially, yep. it's just a little halftone. I mean, it's like lit shadow, and like, yeah, that's yeah. it. And, and yeah. I love that about him. I mean, it's, it's, it's so powerful, but all this is like in the main character. There's maybe in his leg, there's a little halftone, but it's all either just lit or not. It's yep. which is so, so bold to be able to do. He was, he was bold. Mr. Bold. You're absolutely right, Chuck. And so in this, here's why there's the alumni. There we are. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Alumni. I think it might be that. Uh, it sounds a bit like a cheese, doesn't it? Alumni. <laughs> Cheesy gallery. The um, Look at the spotlight right there. And like Chuck says, hardly any halftone. And then we're boom, we're straight into the darks here. Now, in real life, there is a, a difference in tone here. It's more subtle. Frank was very, very subtle. It may look bombastic, but when you got your nose up to his artwork, I used to set the alarms off and Ellie would come down and berate me. Ellie was his wife, would berate me for getting my nose so close to the artwork. But I was like a child that couldn't be told. It just kept going off. Arr, 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 arr. And it was only me. I couldn't go up. Must be that guy over there. I went in really early and he opened the museum for me. And we were just walking around, me and my wife. We were walking around and she was, you know, being civil, but I wasn't right up like that every time setting that alarm off. So I saw lots of Rosetta. I saw lots of Rosetta up close. Tiny little painting. I think they're mostly 18 by 24. So he's basically doing bespoke boards. He was going in and buying an 18 by 24 piece of masonite, which is so cheap. You, you know, you shouldn't really be working on that stuff if you want longevity in your art, because the back of it is just waiting for termites. It's a termite sandwich is what a masonite board is. And if you don't know what masonite board is, it's basically you go to the hardware store, find the cheapest board, shiny on one side, and it's rough on the other. It looks like, uh, on the other, it looks a bit like straw, like stuck together or hair. It looks like a carpet on the other side, but compressed. That's masonite board, cheapest board in the world. And, you know, I wouldn't even touch it. 
having said that, I did work on Masonite board once because Frank did, because I'm just a big, big follower, wanted to try it out. But I soon realized it was a disastrous idea. Very easy to break. Bend it a little bit, bend a little bit more, crunch, totally broken. And hot and then cold weather, damp weather, starts to buckle like this. It's completely porous. And so if you used it for the outside of your house, for instance, you may as well just forget about it. I did it once by accident. I put it around an air conditioner and the rain came on and then it was just hanging there. The rain was just hanging there like a Halloween melting sort of uh, horror. It was horrible. So, so how often was he painting on Masonite? All the time, Rachel. It's like, how, how big, how, also like how big are his paintings actually? Like I was trying to figure out, like I got I got the Mothman one behind me, that, but it's like a big poster. And I, how big is that one in real life? That's that's way bigger than his paintings. Yeah, the yeah. Big, the biggest one I saw was, you know, that's Las Vegas Showgirls one. It's very rarely seen, actually. It's a bunch of Las Vegas Showgirls, and they're pulling a curtain away. Yeah, and to be honest, it's not it's not my favorite because it doesn't have this theater light. It doesn't have it doesn't have much focus to it. It's still a, a carnival of wonder, but I don't come back to it because it's too busy. And that one was the biggest one that I saw in the museum. But strangely, I think the biggest one. And Sarah would correct me if I was wrong in if she was here. I think was the the warrior with the ball and chain. I think that was the biggest one. So let me see if I can find those two. So how, eighteen by how big 20, do you think those are? Uh, well, let's say I think that this one here is eighteen by twenty four. So you, just, you in America, you know what that means. So that's eighteen by twenty four. Yeah. And twenty four inches. So basically, there's the width of it, and there's the height of it. Very small. Very small. He was working with very small brushes. The showgirl one, and here's a tip for you guys if you want to be a professional. How did I blow my art up to be scaled back down for book jackets? Because book jackets are only six by four. And that's probably the reason why I worked that size. Because there's the size it's going to go down to. It's going to go down to that size, a paperback jacket. So why would he paint any bigger than 18 by 24? You know, you're not going to see the detail after a while. So all you have to do to, to scale up and down is you run a line right through like that on any board, any piece of artboard, and make sure you're using a 90 degree angle and go across at any point you like. And there it is perfectly scaled up. That's how I used to scale my artworks up and down. Very easy. And I would just make sure I had one of those T squares like that, or, you know, on my drawing board, and I would just scale across at any point. You can cut across anywhere you like there, and they could scale that down to a, a six by four book jacket. So that's what he was up to. He was thinking, why should I? So I think the showgirls one in comparison, still not that big, Rachel, I think would have been about that size. So more like still big, big for Frank. Yeah. So let's have a look at the showgirls if, I, if I've got it. That's just something I was thinking about recently. It's like, I, yeah. I don't know how big his paintings actually are. For some reason, I thought he was, he was painting bigger than that. Yeah, everyone did. I think I think this the idea, everyone has, they come into the, into the, um, Art gallery and they go, wow, I can't believe how small they are. Yeah. I wouldn't so, have expected that. Yeah, they're small. It's like Vermeer. It's, Vermeer's paintings are like the size of a plate. <laughs> they're tiny, aren't they? There's a reason for that, Chuck. And by the way, Melanie, <laughs> Melanie came in <laughs> Melanie came in here with a bomb today, which we, <laughs> will, we will explode later. And the bomb that Vermeer exploded. He, he managed to, to die without being revealed was he used the original Luce, Lucida. He used the original camera distortion, or not camera distortion, camera Lucida. And what he did was he basically put a, a, a piece of glass in a dark, in a wall, in a dark room, and he would set the model out in the light of the light room. He went to the dark room, the box, and you would see, based on how he had this curved glass, you would see the outside reflected in the dark room. You would see, actually, it's amazing. I mean, imagine that technology. What was from here, 400 years ago or something like that? And that's why his work looks so precise, because he just went in and traced it. And then he painted the trace. Now, he like, obviously, made a camera? Like, sort he of? made a camera out of yeah. just a piece of glass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's why he was able to get away with it, because nobody could have even... You'd have to need... You needed to be a scientist to say... Did you make a piece of glass, stick it in a hole in the wall, and, and then project the outside <laughs> and, and trace it? Nobody would have thought of that. Just so let him do it. <laughs> let him do it. That's what he was doing. But that's yeah. why they were so small. 
because he could only get that in focus, you know, whatever glass he had, he got that in focus. And that's what he did. And the reason why it was compounded that it had to be that is he had no art training at all. Here's a guy that couldn't, had never drawn a stick, and now he's doing perfectly uh, formed figures. But he had a great eye. Look how beautiful and delicate he made those, those color um, choices. He had a good eye. That's what he had. And in fact, preempting the bomb that's coming, it's kind of like he used a prompt and then said, here's what I like based on that prompt. Here's what I like. Oh. And he had an eye for it. Go on, Chip. Oh no, I was I was looking at the your your gallery of things here and going mm -hmm. back to the size. I, I got a print recently of uh Rogue Roman, which is one of my favorites. You got it. Oh yeah. And it's there I so I got the big Frazetta book and I looked at the size in that. It's like 16 inches wide. Yeah. My, my print I got is bigger than the original. It is. The book, yeah, what's in the, that big book we bought, Chuck? I think they're about the size of the paintings, maybe yeah. a little smaller, but close to it. Uh, like the, this is my favorite, you know, all time. And it has the theater light perfectly. Look, there's the theater light all back where we, where we, I mean, it couldn't get more theater light than that. Look at that. We're definitely in the front row of the theater right there. That was really small. That was really small. And I, I think that would have been an 18 by 24. But it's so gorgeous. No matter how beautiful, that, this is the best repro, by the way. I think this was from Heritage Auctions. And so, yeah, this, that's a Heritage Auction piece. So if I blow that up, so what happens? Look at all the mess of it, too. So, you know, it's it's an unknown fact that when people see book jacks, they don't realize that half of Frank's carpet and dog hair is in that <laughs> picture. See that? But because it's a heritage, a heritage auction, so people are going to buy. The, this is for sale to the public, and it did sell. It sold for $2 million, I think. This sold, but what they have to make sure is that you can blow it up and look at it to know what you're getting. Like there's a stain there. See it? You know, it would be a, a, a hardy soul that would go in and try and fix that. Remember Mr. Mr. Bean went in and tried to fix the Vermeer's mother? And he rubbed the face out and then drew it back in in crayons? You'd have to really know what you're doing. Uh, so they say, here's what it is. Uh, warts and all. That's what you're buying. And, you know, you might even say, you know, there's Frank Slipper in there. That's great. I've got a bit of Frank in there with all this debris. So that's a heritage auction um, piece there. And we talked about that, didn't we, with Sarah Frazetta? We talked about that. This yeah, one. a little bit. Is this one on Masonite? Uh, that's a good question. I didn't see the back oh. of it. Okay. But I, I, it, it looks like it, it seems to have a weave to it. I think that's yeah. just so. I think that's just so. Brushed it might be. Yeah. Yeah. It seems very, it looks very organized, Jesso. That doesn't seem to be going up and down. I wonder if he turned it around to the back. You know, I also heard he did it. that. I heard he did the back of Masonite, the textured side, yeah. which they don't yeah. sell anymore in America, at least. They don't sell don't the textured at Home Depot. It's smooth oh. on both sides now. On both sides. Maybe he used that. would have been a smart move, actually. If he just sold the back, which I think the termites would love, then he stops the termites. So that might have been what he did. He worked on the rough side. That would make more sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. That's, that's that question answer. Thanks for that question, uh, Angel. 11? Achilles. Achilles. Achilles 11. Achilles 1 1 or something. Patrick, I have a question. I have a Go follow. ahead. So, so Frank Frazetta uses this really super bold light. You don't do a lot of that spotlighting. And was that a choice or was that just kind of your sensibilities on it? Yeah. Well, that's what I want from you guys. I, I don't want to be another Frank Frazetta. I just want to learn from him and be me. But look at how big I paint. So we're thinking about bringing out big miniatures. That's a reveal there. There we go. Chuck's got one. You mean like Chuck, this? Took me what, what, a yeah. what a oh, segue. What a segue. If you're like Mindworks Studios. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're not familiar with Mindworks <laughs> Studios, let's have a look at those guys. They're wonderful. I've not put it together yet. You haven't put it together. Oh, but it looks that's nice. nice. It looks very nice. Yeah. You're going to do it, Chuck. You're going to actually go in there, oh, yeah. stick it all together I with glue. I was, yeah, I used, to, I do, I mess around with those things when I, when I used to have free time. But yeah. uh, I might actually just do it in a solid color, and maybe yeah. like a wash on it, and like like a statue to instead of trying to render it like you're painting. Yeah, you know, to really show off the sculpt. Yeah. 
Oh, they do great jobs. I showed last time we were on the one that, that Matteo painted for me. I'll bring it again for anyone that missed the show. So it was this one. Cleopatra's Last Dance. And, you know, the work they put in is so amazing. You know, these guys all over the world painting miniatures. And then, well, they put them together first. And then what you have to do, Chuck, is you have to sand all the seams. You have to sand all those little seams. So let's have a look uh, up here and have a look at what they look like. The 10% off your first order. Did you get 10% off your first order, Chuck? Sure did. Excellent. So what they did when I was with them is I would sign some books and you would sell the books and then you would get your little statue and you would paint based on the paintings in the book. You had to imagine the bag because they're looking at 2D here and I'm doing, they're doing 3D based on a 2D image, which is a, a spectacular thing. So there we go. There's, there's the signature series. And some of them are just busts. So when you make them, they look like that, if you're really great at it. And then you start to paint. That's what, that's the next thing. So this is the one Chuck bought here. Hecate and goddess of witchcraft. Oh, I like that skeleton. I mean, look at that. They've turned that skeleton completely around. That's astonishing. It's amazing what they can do. So yeah, going back to Chuck's question um, and Rachel's as well, like even that little portion there, Rachel, is nowhere close to Frank Frazetta's showgirls. Frank Frazetta's showgirls would be probably there on that. And to be honest, I wouldn't want to paint like that. I have done it and decided I won't do it anymore. It's just too... Oh, oh. Close your eyes, kitties. There's going to be some male genitalia. I'll speed it past so you don't see it. You'll have to just imagine it. And if you do imagine it, it's all on you. Because I told you to close your eyes, and it means you want to look. Okay. Oh, no. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, Jesus. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, top of the screen. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, see, so you try that's your best. It. It's worse. There's the budgie smugglers we talked about earlier there, Rachel. That's what, <laughs> and Melanie, when you come to Australia, just prepare yourself. Just don't stand <laughs> close. Don't stand okay. close. Don't too, stand too close to the, um, the, oh, good, we're safe there. <laughs> the old, uh, the old vaudeville trick there. So, yeah, I do paint differently. I use more lost edges than Frank, for instance. So what I, I believe should do is, is just grow. Am I going to get flagged on that? How do they know? How does YouTube know that that happened in, for that brief second? How does it know? It I mean, we me. might be okay. Maybe it didn't you catch us. So? <laughs> yeah. They have to catch us, do they? Yeah, yeah. We're on the run. That or it might have something to do with the spoiler that's coming out. The spoiler? spoiler. Oh, right. Yeah. The bomb, you mean? Is that what you bomb. mean? Yeah. The bomb's oh, coming. Geez. That's another word that we probably shouldn't yeah, say that's... too much. <laughs> it's right now. Blame Melanie. Yeah. So, yeah. So, what I use is a lot of sfumato. I use a lot of sfumato, which Frank used too. I mean, look at the distance here. When you're working with multi compositional pieces, things are going to meet each other. There's going to be tangents. There's no getting away from it. So, how do we, how do we adjust for that? If I want his face to stand out and know that this hand and knee is coming toward me, then I'm going to spoon Matto right there. Just use atmospheric perspective that usually happens over like maybe a hundred yards on a misty day. And I bring it right forward right here. And it is a cave scene too. So have agency. The You're the artist. You can do anything you want. You can create this guy like he's on Mount Rushmore and that everything is 500 feet high. And so there's going to have all that atmospheric perspective. That's what I'm thinking all the time. Even with his arms coming in to join against his, his body there, I've put some of that in. But as we come over here to Rajiv, look how everything's crisp. It's all clear cut. And it's more clear cut because it's the camera eye. And if we go, whoops, there are, oh, geez, again, and close up too. If we go in tight there, look at all those artifacts around the hair, for instance. There's not the sign of any softness in that hair. That's not how, how the human eye sees things. So it's a whole different world. Okay, I'm going to speed back up again. <laughs> All right, kitties, you've been warned. We're going back up. I think we got past it there. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> are you okay? Yeah, so it fly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He's okay. He's got his, <laughs> got his budgies on. Ah, Jesus. 
That's it. There's nothing to be. I'm sorry. That's it. There's nothing to be done. <laughs> that bomb that's coming later is nothing. It's nothing. Oh yeah. lord. I hope you're okay. I didn't didn't kill you with that that noise. <laughs> so, and there's another one. There's no kid. Well, for people. For people. It's I don't wild, care. But... You like stop noticing them until it's important like this. <laughs> it's for people. Who cares? Come on. Yeah. Go to Europe. Walk down a beach in Europe, and if you can't take that, you you have only got yourself to blame. <laughs> So you yeah, they're all in the walking, mirror. Look in the mirror. Ah, black dot. <laughs> Put a black dot in the mirror when you walk past. Go. I nearly saw that. <laughs> yeah, thank God. <laughs> Find <laughs> places in the world. <laughs> Find out your height. Put a black spot wherever you walk. Uh, yeah, so that's what I do. I put it on pretty tight, uh, and it's most for the. It's mostly for the collector. I put it in pretty tight, and I say, look, it's going to vary from here, but there's this position. And then we're good to go. And from then on, it's me. It's it's the Patrick show. But look how stiff it is before I start putting all that stuff on. It's stiff. And I want to just make that more fluid as I go. Look at the how these serratus muscles are starting to, to move around. Look, Notice how that arm is. St- oh, my God. That's that. <laughs> oh, oh. How is that even possible? All I did was try to zoom in. <laughs> We're going to have to cut that whole segment. The live stream's still up. We're good. Ask the live stream if anybody, (laughs) has anyone fainted? (laughs) Look, if the the Carolina girls haven't fainted, aren't on their screen, everything's fine. Because that's, there's the history of fainting right there. Carolina, that's where women used to faint. I'm sweating. Yeah. (laughs) Get on your sweat. Yeah. How did this happen? I thought I had everything sorted. Now It's Halloween. Everything's scary. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to zoom in here again. And if that happens again, we're okay. Again, we're okay. Do you have Look a how... second window that you can drag it into, make it safe, then you bring it in? Oh, really? Tell me that again, Chuck. Do you have a second window you can drag it to? Oh, I see. Yes, that's a good, that's a good idea. I might do that. Or should I? Like we said, it's Halloween. Didn't we say at the start of this, you know, um, let's not worry about this. Let's be the channel that stops cowtailing to all these people that say, oh, art, oh, here's what you have to do if you want to be an artist. You have to censor all. No, we're not going to do it. I'm making a stand. Who's with me? Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, what? No. Okay. Just don't like it. Leave the chat. Was that a hesitant? Melanie, there. Did you have to lift? I was hesitant, up? Rachel. I'm just, I'm just not sure exactly what I'm agreeing to here. <laughs> We're agreeing to the art is art, and everything else is everything yeah. else. There should be no censorship within yeah. reason. In yeah, free. Art. Okay. Let, let him be free. Let be. Let him be. Free. <laughs> let him be free. <laughs> let them be free. I know what you're saying. Okay, so this looks really tight and stiff, doesn't it? But watch how that becomes more and more fluid as we go down. So I'm drawing with paint. So there it is. Look at it get more and more fluid all the time. So I'm drawing as I, I'm painting as I draw. The initial block in is just that. And I need to work off of that. Look how stiff this seems compared to the fleshy nature of these. So every single thing is a micro decision. Can I make a more thoughtful looking? Can I... Can I fumetto the eyes back to make them more sinister? Can I do all of these things? Even there, look how faded that's becoming under his chin. Because I want to bring that face forward. This like little Eugenie guy. I want him not to be the star of the show, but I want him to be a storyteller. I want to show that he is responsible for what's going on. Are these guys really that brutal? Or is he doing a little bit of Halloween on me? The story's up to you. I want to leave a lot of it for interpretation. But here's a good moment here. Look at the underpainting. See it, how it's starting to die? And you'd, you'd see a lot of that in Frank's work as well, where he just went, that's not important. I'll leave it like that. I'm not as gutsy as that yet. I finished the whole painting, mostly because the collector expects it. So when you start your career, you put your work out there. And whatever your last piece is, that's what the collector expects for their piece. And if you want to change your art, you change it very, very slowly. You can't just suddenly do a Picasso and go, oh, sorry, I'm Picasso today. And now I, I decided I'm going to do Picasso art. That's not what we agreed to. So when you're working for collectors, you've got to really give them what they saw when they said, I'd like a piece as well, like this. You've got to give them that. 
and then do some experimental pieces and hang them up and say, I'm going to do another piece like this. Would you be interested? And that's how you grow it. But you've got to be fair to the, the collector. You know, so I'm working down that, that paint in there. But every single thing, look at his face has changed again. Do you see that? He's Now he's looking over here with this sort of, this iridescent dye. Got an iridescent dye now. That wasn't in the original idea. It's in here now. So now he's coming in. I'm starting to fumato these eyes. I want that execution to have no soul. So all of these things are, they're ideas as I go along. I'm playing with the anatomy here. And as you glaze on top, you lose a lot of what you started with because you're you're constantly in flux. And some of your choices are probably not as good as they could have been if you held back a little bit and said, let the original underpainting show. So that I'm working on all the time to pull back a little bit and don't go into render hell. We all know about render hell, right? And that's where I fell into. We all do. We all fall into render hell. But during the, the in the heat of battle, I'm still going to come out with something good, you know? And sometimes I'm a little a little uh, mean as well in my art materials. I know Frank used Mickey Mouse watercolors. I made my own mild stick out of a COVID mask. <laughs> there it is up there. You know, we got so many of them now. What am I going to do with them all? You know, I had them in the car, the glove box, everywhere. So I just wrapped a, a rag around there and used the the COVID mask as a, because as a, it has elastic on it to tie it all together. And that means I can rest against the canvas on just basically a piece of stick with a soft end to it. That's how the old masters work, but they had leather pouches. They put a leather pouch on there. And I could go to the store and buy a leather pouch for $12, with a little string on it, Bing! which the kind of thing you put gold coins in, that kind of thing. And I thought, don't be ridiculous, Patrick. Who are you, Lord Pompadour? You like my leather pouch on the end of a stick? It's a mouth stick. So I don't do it, you know, but you might want to. Maybe I will. Maybe I will do that. But you make your own as you go along there. And I'm totally redesigning that. And look, it's, it's like the Patrick show now. I'm going to get out of this here because I want it to be you guys. So let's get in. So you can see how many layers I, I work very thin as I go along, putting more color on. And I like to work thin because the underpainting is important to me. And if you work thin, it still shows through. You start putting whites in, start and add white. Earn your whites. Make sure that you're mixing. If you go for a white, pick up a yellow first and just tint that with a touch of white. If that's what you're, if you're working with flesh tones. Never take that white until the very end when you really need it. And I'll put it on the edge of that coin, maybe right there as we go through. See it? Bling. And maybe just there. And that is, look at the state of that brush. You know, when I when I use at a big scale, you can just go in there with a rotten old brush and and blend as you paint. That kind of stuff is pretty hard to do when you're working small. And then I'll I'll knock that back to oh here we go over there. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see what you've got to show. <laughs> That's no come on he's a he's a model he's a good guy. Uh, okay, we're safe over there. So you can see here when I was putting that white on, see that I came back in again with a softer brush and just soft the edge of it. And we're done, you know, we're done. But that arm looks nothing like the arm over there. You know, someone says, um, someone said once, did you ever do abstract art? All art is abstract. It's all an illusion. It's paint on a 2D surface, surface and it only looks like it's something else. That's abstract art. Everything's abstract art. But within that arm, that's an abstract art arm. Look at all those oranges in there. Beautiful. I love it. I don't care. I'm going to go in there. Now compare it to Rajiv's arm. Magnificent arm. Rajiv's a magnificent beast of a man. But look at it. It's all kind of one tone. It's all Californian tan, isn't it? And I found out why Rajiv's burnt. Remember I said, um, I think he might be a welder. He's a fire twirler. He works in the circus like Cirque du Soleil. So there's the, the wages of war. That must have really hurt. Oh, whoa, look at that. So that's why Rajiv is the way he is and why he's such a brilliant model. Is that he wasn't on the gym, using gym, nothing wrong with that, using gym machines. He was building his muscles from climbing and turning and torquing and twisting and carrying. And so he looks exactly like the kind of man that would have been around in any mythical time that was always active, always totally active.
I bought a, an Apple Watch the other day, not showing off, but put it on for the first time. I saw you had one, Chuck. Put it on the other day so I'm not alone in the elite club. Uh, and uh, and it showed me how far I walked. And I, honestly, you know, if I looked at that five years ago, I, what, what happened in the future, Patrick? Did you go in the old people's home? You know, there's hardly any steps at all. So it's like a kick in the ass. I got to, is that all I've walked? 300 steps? I'm not an invalid. So Rajiv's not like that. He's climbing, he's jumping, he's grabbing, he's, he's twirling, he's bouncing, he's doing all kinds of things. And it all comes out in the wash. That's who I need for a model. That's who I need. And then I'll extrapolate it. Look at how I've changed all of this. You know, is it there? Somewhere it is. It's in there somewhere. These ribs look wrong. Why do those ribs look like that? I'll throw it to my alumni. Why do those ribs look like that? That's Why a status. <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys. You see what happens when you come into the Anatomy of Style course? You really start to go, this is easy stuff. So there's the ribs coming down in a different direction. And so the serratus are your go-to for rhythm coming from that neck through that nipple. And off you go with those serratus. And at the same time, once you've got that technique, you don't want to go, I'll get it exactly in that line. Wobble it in a knot. Wobble it around. It's just the ballpark. Make it more energetic. Uh, just like that arm is. Just energetic all the way down. Look at that tendon going down to the, <clears throat> down to the um, ulna bone. Look at it. It's fantastic. We see a little bit of it there, but not much. But I know it. And I put it in. Bingo. Down to the radius, that actually. That one. It seems like it's going down to the ulna, but it branches over to this side. And on that, let's have a little bit of anatomy. Let's have a look. That very muscle. Let's go look at it. So in, in my course, we'll look at this little guy every once in a while and, and um, take the mystery out of, of how things work. So that big tendon we just saw there seemed to be going over to the ulna bone. But what was going over to the ulna bone was this, this little um, aponeurosa. It's a little sort of thing that attaches onto the flesh, strangely. But there's the big player, that radius bone right there. That radiates, that turns across that ulna bone and brings the thumb in toward the body. But I don't want to bore the um, audience. I'm going to take questions. Um, that's for advanced students. Uh, Melanie, Rachel, anything in there? Yeah, so we do have a question um, from Jordan. He asks, do you have any advice or exercises to help get over perfectionism? I haven't drawn for some time and I'm struggling to start again because I am too hung up on the end result. Yeah, that's a common problem. It's what we all do. And what I've been advising, I've got a new cohort in there. I think, I wonder if Jordan's with me in that. I've got a lot of students at the moment with the new Masters Academy as well. Can you ask Jordan, is he with me at the moment? Because I've got a couple of Jordans and I'm wondering which one he might be. Can you ask Jordan, is he with me or is he just by chance another Jordan? I have a few Jordans. My um, calendar is like a war zone at the minute. So um, that's a good segue into I'm teaching with the new Masters Academy at the moment. And they asked me would I take some mentors in as well. And they came in like, like hundreds of them. And when I looked at it, I went, wow, that's amazing. Uh, but I can only do one day. And they put them all in one day. By the end of that day, I'm, I'm starving. I don't get a chance to eat. And new masters, don't worry about me. I could do with a bit of that, a little bit of lean times. I want to be more like Rajiv to a few more steps. And so by the end of the day, I'm wasted. I'm like, that. I go, wow, I'll eat anything. Just give me anything. I'll eat it. Tin of beans, cold. That's what I, by the end of the day, that's who I am. Did the answer, did Jordan say? Maybe he doesn't want to stay. That's fine. Uh, he didn't, uh, he says he's not currently in your class, but he studied with you at QUT in 2017, 18. Get out of here, Jordan. QUT. Oh, wow. <laughs> what, was the, what was the year? 17 or 18. Wow. Unbelievable. So QUT is a university here. Oh, okay. It's for really, really great students. Go to QUT. When I first went there, the change in quality was just amazing. It's just so, they also, I never met, well, I met one or two students that were a problem, but for that, that college is just so pristine. The, the minds that go in there and come out of there, uh, they just changed the world down there. They're, they're curing cancer down in QUT. 
So QUT has uh, medical, it has arts, it has everything. And when I went up for an award, I was up for the vice chancellor's award. I went into the big auditorium. And and when I watched the screen, they said, here's who the awards are for. And they asked us to stand up. And there's just a few of us. And I was one and I stood up. And then they came on and they said, and so the team from, you know, B Block, and it shows them going to Africa and giving people new bionic eyes and stuff, all created in QUT. And, uh, and then we have Patrick. He teaches people how to draw. Hmm. Nothing. It was just, I felt so stupid, you know, draw us little things. You know, it's important. I think art's really important. It feeds the soul. So they're fixing people and I'm feeding the soul. I think it's all all good. It all comes out in the wash. But what a what a university. So Jordan, that's great to see you back almost. Uh, it's great to hear that someone from QUT is um in the in the live stream. Fantastic. All right, Jordan. <clears throat> now, after all of that, I love Jordan from all those time ago. What was the question? The question, uh, do you have any advice or exercises to help get over perfectionism? Yeah. I would say gesture, obviously, is the first thing, is stop drawing long poses. Stop it. Stop it right now. Stop it and do one a week. And that's that's your lot. You're not allowed anymore. It's back to Oliver Twist. Please, sir, can I have some more? No, you can't. Not until the end of the week when you've eaten all your dinner. You can't have any dessert until you eat your dinner. So render is dessert. It's, you know, after the first 15 minutes, all you're doing is just repeating yourself over and over. And it's fine. That's basically what painting is. But when I'm painting, that's why I completely, I always extrapolate on the painting, meaning I change it and change it and change it all the way through and keeps me energized. So gesture, gesture, gesture. And that's the key. That's the mileage. It's all in there. And try and use every edge of your pencil. Use the broad edge, use the thin edge, tip up, tip down. Make sure that when you're working, you're not just drawing with a fine line. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's always a disclaimer. There's nothing wrong with fine line at all. But the caveat is it encourages perfection. That's the problem with it. Now you might go, don't you want to be perfect, Patrick? I want to express myself. And I think that's perfection. If you want to get everything completely right, then you're not thinking of Expressing yourself, you're thinking of ego. You're trying to show how brilliant you are with every kind of little line you make. And then it's gone. It's everything that you loved about art is gone because you're basically showing off to the world. So, you know, kill the ego. Kill the ego. Do lots of gesture. Give yourself one, one render at the end of the week. And it's not demonized. That's the answer. The answer is to let fly. Let fly. Okay, so let's go back and let's have a look at some work from the Illuminati. Let's have a see. Let's see what we have. So yeah, uh, ask Chuck, that's it. We're done. It was one thing and then the other. I'm just leaving it there. I don't care. And now we should go to the censored version. Maybe it's some, oh no, what is Laura brought in? I think that's okay. For some reason, nobody minds. A I single butt is okay. <laughs> I think it's okay. I think yeah. it's because little kids, you can't stop kids showing their asses. So you could see little kids running around all the time. I think it might be that. Oh, it's just an ass. So maybe that's the, the thing. It's for, oh, Laura. Oh. And now I've drawn attention to it. It's just madness. <laughs> it's just, oh, so ridiculous. What a ridiculous world. <laughs> it's just a ridiculous world. Okay, so let's have a look. It is funny, like, what's okay and what's not. It's really funny, isn't it? <laughs> and, who, and you know what I want to know? What are you doing in here if you're offended by the human figure? What are you doing in here? I hope get that out. everyone in here, I hope <laughs> everyone in here is, yeah, get out. I hope that everyone is here because they want to draw who we are, what we are. As, we're magnificent. We're magnificent. Let's, let's um, celebrate it. Let's celebrate it. I know what I explained exploitation is of course two different things i just wish people could understand that yeah. now because <laughs> there's nothing more beautiful and expressive than a human figure it's a marvelous thing now this is lovely up here laura i want to give laura some affirmations before i um ask questions i think that's wonderful and it harkens back to what we just heard from jordan 
is look how it's not finished. It's an exploration of rhythm and a little bit of structure over here. It's exploration. And now let's move on to another exploration, see what we get. And over here, we're exploring something else. And over here, oh, what are we looking at here? We're looking at taking away some of the mechanics and getting some big, broad feels. This is lovely, Laura, that big, broad feel there. Look, there's a big moment. Look at it. Wow. Could you make it any simpler and yet express it so well? That's the art of sophistication, simplicity. Going back to Einstein again, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it yourself. So there we go, the sophistication of simplicity. Wonderful. I would probably say there, if we could just bring that in a little bit just there, it looks a little bit latismous, but it doesn't matter because this is just an exploration. It's a very fast drawing. That's the thing. So I wouldn't want Laura in the time she's drawing it to correct it if there's such a thing in art because everything's just exploration. But what we can do is come back later and say next time this, next time that. And that's the way to avoid getting locked in the weeds of being a perfectionist. And so these are wonderful to do. Do five of them. Look at all five, six. Look at six of them and go next time this, that, and this will be on my radar. And you fix it and fix it and fix it. So if you're always erasing, you've erased all your thoughts. You no longer have any record of what it is you need to learn next. But if you leave it all in, you can go, that needs to be learned next. This needs to be learned next. And then you can look back on your work with pride and say, I grew this organically. And here's where I started. You erase everything. You've got no, no record at all. I would be interested, Laura, in asking you what's happening here because I love it. What were you, what were you exploring there? I was trying to figure out where the shoulders is the the reference illustration from you was talking about contraposta. So you have yeah. the butt tilted like so. Yeah. And I feel like the shoulders, when you say contraposta, I would have thought the shoulders would have been tilted in the opposite direction, but it felt like they were mirror, they were almost perpendicular. Yeah. And so I was trying to figure out, does the angle for the top of contrapasta have more to do with the shoulders or the rib cage? It has more to do with the rib cage because have a look at my shoulders at the minute now. So there's one up, there's one back. Look what you can do with a shoulder. It has the scapula at the back and it's on buffers. It's basically on buffers inside, muscles that are attached to the rib cage. But the, the, the scapula itself is actually moving around like this. So it can turn, it can turn around corners and stuff. So let's say I'm just standing completely relaxed. If I stand up like this and I just, if I stand like that. So I've got a straight leg over here and a hip coming up to there and a shoulder leaning toward it. That's what happens. You see it in those cool, like if you watch Star Trek, you know, when they beam down, they're all standing like that because they're really cool. So that means they, they're ready for anything. They can shoot, you know? And that's what they were gunfighters. Dean Martin was great for it. Every time he saw Dean Martin, he was leaning like that. So that's the classic lean as if you're just the coolest guy in the world. But what happens is you start to do things and then that, that changes. So contraposta was really just about a relaxed figure. And once they start moving, then no longer the case. And also it's only a figure standing on, a, on, on ground. The second you put your foot up on a stool, for instance, the whole thing is out of the uh, out of the question because you've actually got something else to lean against. So it's only a standing figure, really. So and then when you start to do all that, then you can't really tell. Like you said, Laura, you have to look at the rib cage to see where that's tilting. So you would look round about here. The rib cage always makes itself known. So right there on the tenth rib is what we're looking at. And so let's say, I think it feels like a tilt that direction, like that. And then so what you do is you you opposite that everywhere you go. So that's the way of it. So it's a tricky one. You know, it's it's um, it basically means you have to be standing. So for this standing pose, the weight bearing leg, the shoulder goes toward it. And then if you wanted to take it another way, then the head goes this direction. So there's that cool pose. See, look how cool she is just standing there, ready to shoot. So this comes up, this comes down like that. And that's contrapostal. And that means that this leg is relaxed like that. So that gluteus has to come down and that one's tight. 
So that's classic contrapposto there. And that means that leg is somewhat coming toward us and that one's somewhat going away from us. So that's how contrapposto works. But what, what happens when you're doing these explorations? This is why I love that, that you have this, you have that, and then you have this. I mean, that's wonderful. And that's when a body's in motion. When a body's in motion, contrapposto goes out the window. Think about when you're walking. When you walk, and especially when you run, you're actually falling. You're always falling when you walk. That's why if you're running and you suddenly stop, you fall over, because you've been constantly falling forward all the time. And so you don't have any contrapposto. At that point, then your nose is in charge of everything. Your nose is coming down to the weight bearing leg. So if she leans forward here and brings her head down, look at that great drawing. Here's my teacher, that, that great drawing. That nose is here now, which means that leg has to come over here like that. Who walks like that? Get out of that person's way. They have, they have a problem. But that's what's happening. If someone leaned right forward like that, they'd have to bring that, that foot forward to stop themselves falling over. So that's when contrapposto stops. So contrapposto is basically just a relaxed balance figure. After that, the nose is in charge. The nose will bring you where you need to go. That old saying, I stole it from, uh, from what was his name? Really funny guy. The nose knows where the toes goes. Uh, what was his name? Bornstein, I think. He's in the New Masters. I wish I could remember his name. Sheldon. Sheldon. The nose knows where the toes goes. Great mnemonic. So we use a lot of mnemonics in class. Strange memory clues to remember things. So let's have a look here where Laura took this. So all those explorations, uh, this is back to Jordan again. That's what you need to do in terms of importance. Uh, this most important. Because that is mileage. Mileage is how many, how many times do you explore before you get over here? And by the time you got there, you master the world. You've mastered everything. So all these wonderful, look at that lovely fluid figure right there. A beautiful fluid figure. Wonderful. So that's the way it goes. And when you start bringing the hand into it, the contrapposto then goes off a little bit out of whack because that shoulder comes up. So basically the contrapposto will only give you a, a ballpark feel for the balance. And then after that, and when the legs come apart like this, when the legs come apart like this, then you're basically the nose is in charge now. The nose goes between the toes on that kind of figure. So the contrapposto is just for a moment. And then the action happens, then it changes. Things start to change. But what a dynamic start. And then you start to, to riff off of it. So you took, a, you took one of the most difficult drawings, actually, Laura. And this is time for a spruik. Don't let me forget that somebody won a, a drawing. So time for a spruik over here, uh, the anatomy of style, the power of osmosis. I, I put to my class a, a, not a task, a, what would we call it, a challenge? I don't even want to think like that. Just an idea to go into, oh my God, into the anatomy of style, the power of osmosis, and draw what I've already drawn, and the whole book's about draw what I've drawn and then extrapolate off of it. Imbibe the thoughts, imbibe the drawings into your own art engine by copying and then asking yourself, what is it that I've just copied and why will it help me? And so Laura has chosen, I think, look at that brilliant pose. Shout out to Alana Briegelmans. What a model. What an incredible model. Okay, the magic shimmer. Let's see what that was. And you know, I dread going through another picture here. That's okay. Good. Well done there, Katie. Mm -hmm. With your jingle jangle hide and everything that might be offensive. I think that uh I think if it's for educational purposes, you two will let it fly. So That's just... what they said. That's yeah. what they said. <laughs> They're liars. Liars. <laughs> Lie. They flagged it and they said no. I said okay. what? They they're liars. Yeah. They flag one. That's flag weird one. because there's some other videos that are way more questionable that yeah. are out there yeah. that are There's under the, the vein of uh education that definitely are not. <laughs> yeah. If it did some horror in it, you know, if it, if she had a knife in her back, it'd be fine. Yeah. yeah. If there's some horror, that's fine. Okay. It's just the, the nudity part. What a terrible thing to say, Patrick. Why would you say that? <laughs> It's kind of the truth. 
So look, look what Laura did. So this was one of the big challenges in the parasmosis because a lot of them are uh, step by step. It's kind of the advanced version of the anatomy of style. Uh, so it's a different thing. It's the anatomy of style part two. But the challenge was that you start with this only and then you do that and you extrapolate on it. So that in my anatomy of style, but one, there was more stages to get where we are. And this gets you to learn how to learn as well. So I don't give you everything. If I give you everything, then you just copy what you see. So I want a bit of copy what you see and then extrapolate and ask yourself all the way along, ask yourself, well, we started with this. Now, why is it like that? Why is it like that? Well, the rest of the book all the way through will give you all those answers. And you keep coming back to those drawings again and you draw them over and over and keep asking why. And why is that we have a great trochanter in here? And the gluteus medius and the gluteus maximus are both pulling in toward that bone. There it is. And that's why this has changed to that. One moment. That's just one moment in the whole drawing. But that was a tricky drawing. That's one of the harder drawings, this one. So most of them, actually, we're into the very advanced part. So as the book goes through, you'll get more and more advanced challenges like this one. But basically, if you draw that over and over and over, and don't even look over here for until you've drawn 10 of those, then you'll very slowly understand why this is so important to get to here. And if you drew that over and over and over until you get to here, and then you can draw that without even worrying. And look how different these characters are and their, their wideness, their, top, their height, everything is different. But the main ballpark figures, the 10th rib are all in there, for instance. The iliac crest is all in there. They're all there. And you can do anything, anything. You can draw anything you want from any angle based on simple construction over here. And there's another big challenge, hardly anything given to you there to get over to here. But within this book, there's tons of stuff. It's the anatomy of style one uh, that gives you uh, more simplistic views of this and the study sheets as well. I should really show him. Uh, let's see, where is it? Anatomy of style. That's the old workshops. I, I did something sad today. I didn't want to do it. So the anatomy of style workshop is up there for a year and then it's gone. But what I left it up for like two years three years. And then I thought I've got to, I've got to delete it now. And that's what happened there. Sorry, guys, that's the first workshop no longer available. So the workshop's up for a year, but I usually let it run for another couple of months or so. So let's go up into the store here. So there's movie downloads and that's quite popular now how to draw the fantasy female figure. Uh, 14 hours of that. A lot of there stuff. There was a question about that course. There was? Um, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Charlie Danger Davies. Um, oh, so yeah, that's your real name. <laughs> uh, he says he's working through the female fantasy course. Just wanted to oh, ask okay. about using lines as a stylistic choice. How do you decide what to describe with lines and what to leave loose and light? Good question. Well, first of all, look at the foot here compared to uh, the hand, for instance. So I feel the hand has this little quality to it, you know? Always frightened me that when someone's doing that. So it has that quality to it, almost a cat-like quality. And the foot doesn't. So we let the foot fall into sfumato. If you want to think about where would you put a dark line, you put a hard dark line on a bone. Be a good start. That would be a good start. So you can see on all the bone areas here, I have a dark line. But also look how thick that line is there on the stomach. Because I wanted to denote, denote weight on the stomach and so a thicker line automatically in your subconscious says that's a heavy thing. And so these are my thought processes. That's a heavy thing. I wanted her to be mysterious. And using that idea of sfumato and atmospheric perspective, and imagine once again, she's 100 feet tall, that her head can be misty. And that's quite a scary thing, not quite seeing a face, not quite seeing it, and no pupils at all. So look at how hard edge those lines are in the hair. So I wanted to just feel that bring yourself into the face. If there's too much detail on the outsides, you might head on out past the figure. So I'm making a halo of sfumato there for you to look at, and that's the mystery of it. So there's a million choices for line. It can be a tangent thing, the thing that arm is going to touch that breast too close, 
I'm just going to not do that because human vision doesn't do that. Human vision really just softens the edge of anything that meets another thing. It's microscopic, but that's what it does. And so I, I broaden that. And that's what I do. It. Camera doesn't do that. Camera just, look how hard edged my shoulder is against the background there. It's almost like a knife edge. And even that little feather thing in the background, what the hell, Patrick, are you doing with feathers in your room? I'm just full of fantasy. I'm all filled with fantasy. I want it everywhere I go. There's a big clock up there with brass cogs turning. I love it. Just wonderful. Speaking of that, Patrick, uh, yes, Chris please. Steer is requesting a tour of your studio. Um, oh, Chris. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris is over. Uh, Chris is many miles away from me. Chris is an Australian. He's in my new, new class. Chris, you're most welcome. But it's like a kibbutz. What you have to do is fix the palings on the way up. So I'll give you a hammer and nails. You can fix the outside and we'll come into the studio together. Because that's the problem. I'm in here in this little oasis. And outside the house is falling apart. I don't want to go out and do all that. I need a gardener. I need a gardener to go out and do that. So, Chris, you're welcome. If you got, if you're going to fix the palings for me, is that a deal? Are you handy? It's not much of a tour. It's just that. It's what you see there. What's he say? Have you lost him? Is he ran for the hills? No, nah, it's just a delay. Is that? How to draw fantasy female? Ooh, oh. draw fantasy female figures. Like I would know, but yeah, look at all the choices of line there. As this goes by on the screen, just look at the choices of line everywhere. Look at how hard line that nose was in that area, and it all bleeds into the. the look at that soft halo there on that shoulder. You got to look fast. Look at that soft halo on that tenth rib there, eighth and ninth rib actually. So always choices. The dusty floor. You know, that heavy thigh, a thick line, that heavy stomach, a thick line. You know, anywhere you go, top of the breast, a soft line. All of those things are choices that make your art more atmospheric. So basically make make a simple choice and then extrapolate off it. So I'll do a heavy line on a heavy piece. The bottom of the gluteus, a heavy, thick line. The top of the breast, a thin line. Look at that one going all the way back into mist. Look how it brings that hand forward. Look how buttery all the pencil marks are. Beautiful. Do that. Do this here. Make big marks on, on newsprint. Newsprint and charcoal are the same as, as oils to me. It's just dry oils. And then when you get your pencil out, think of it as a brush. You don't be thick on the edge of it, thin on the top of it, you know, back and forth all the time. And when you're using your pencil, turn it. You sharpen it on the page. Not while you're drawing. Dr turn and draw, turn and draw. And after a while, you won't even think about it. That's what I do all the time. And you hone a pencil that's so beautiful, you couldn't get one from the store that nicely um, shaved, unless you're Chuck, who sh sharpens all his pencils on a, on a sand belter. I bet that's the wrong term, isn't it? <laughs> Look at me. I'm trying, to be all, I'm trying to be all down the earth. Yeah, no sand belter, your house right? is falling apart, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I got a sand belter. Wear one every day. Um, What's it called, Chuck? Belt sander. I'm a big fan. I'm going to start a whole, like, Tool time version you of water classes. <laughs> oh my! My homespun solutions to these problems. It was brilliant. I couldn't believe you did it. I thought you were joking. No, no, Chuck, it's great. I'm telling Chuck you, I'll do, I'll do twenty pencils in five minutes. Um, <laughs> good for the week. <laughs> I thought you were joking, and there you were. You were doing it. So there's you the answer. You did do it. I, I get, that's the answer to the question. I'll go and get one of those builder sanders and do the same thing. Terry, you know, I came from working class and used to work on the building side, but it wasn't in that department. It was, yeah, forget about it, Patrick. You, 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 that's long behind you. My dad was a plasterer, a drywaller. So I was just covered in cement all the time, just mixing cement. Just a big, dumb cement mixer. That's all I was. But I tell you, it humbles you. Okay, so beautiful stuff there. Um, Laura, any questions, Laura? Anything that you found difficult for me to answer? Yeah, actually, if you jump back into your diagram, you were just talking about how you see the butterfly pneumatic on the hip when it turns, but yep. you have pulled that away in the final render. Why did you do that? I wanted to not show the nuts and bolts. So basically what Laura's talking about there, for, the, for anyone that's come in for the first time and, and seen any of this method, is that we can find mnemonics. So mnemonics, this is what I work with all the time. 
I mean, strange mem memory clues. Strange memory clues. So basically, if you think of the gluteus, all of the gluteus is an upside down butterfly like this. Whoops. Like that. Then you can get placement. You see how I did it right there on the great trochanter? You can get placement for the gluteus. I'll give you this big part at the bottom and the small part at the top. But it's, it's technique. And so we want to hide the nuts and bolts. We don't want to see these cogs turning because that's not a cog. <laughs> Meet my teacher. He draws two flowers and calls them cogs. We don't want to see the nuts and bolts of how we did it. That's the mystery at the end. So we fade that back. We certainly don't want to show how we did it. And that's the magic because nobody cares. They want to see like it was easy to do it. And so we have these wonderful mnemonics. I mean, that really helped me a lot. And I just shade, I can just do that with pencil and then push up with my thumb and get a very close to finished render on a gluteus that looks right because we come off that hip now and still with that great trochanter in mind and push on like this. And we have basically the nuts and bolts there, the great trochanter at the top of your femur bone and these muscles wrapping around it. And then we fade it back. And nobody's the wiser of why that was so easy to do. It was so easy to do because we had those those things. But if we look at the model, we really don't see it, do we? We don't really see it, but it's in there. It's in there. It's going around a corner. And so got to think of that little butterfly going around a corner. And really, the great trochanter. Let's go back in here again. It's over there. So she's really tight in the buns department. So that's another thing, you know, you expand things, you want to see a little bit more fluidity in it. So I want to get more bun in there for my for my buck. That's two, two analogies in one doesn't make any sense. Mixed metaphor, mixed metaphor right there. But you can see how it helps because it gives you that sacrum if you want to add to it at the top. So that's why, Laura. So you could say it comes into writing as well. Murder your darlings. Murder your darlings. And that's when a writer writes something so fantastic in Florida. They go, I waltzed, I waltzed amongst the clouds of fluffy daffodils and found a butterfly of magnificent splendor. And then you read it back and you go, what an idiot. Who's going to read that, you moron? And so you just say, I walked through the daffodils and there was a, a butterfly that needed some investigation. That's, that's awful too. So somewhere in the middle, you're going to find something. I walked among the daffodils and a butterfly caught my eye. You know, that people can read. But all that fluffy stuff, we don't want to see. That's the mechanics of it. So murder your darlings. And we're going to say murder the cogs instead. We don't want to show how we did it. We don't want to show off is basically what it was. But for this, this thing that I said, um, censor, as, at this drawing, I would call that a tangent that doesn't work. It looks like she's got a tag on her arm. I would, for this, extrapolate there and put the breast there. And that's going to give me a little bit more boom. And on this, she's actually almost flat on both feet. So we're not, not getting that asymmetry that I really like. I love asymmetry. So she's almost got the nose, nose where the toes goes. If I do that, her nose is going to the, the center of gravity. And so that was the weight bearing leg, but she's almost on two flat feet here. And that's why we're not seeing that lovely pull down here to give us the asymmetry. It's almost like both of these gluteus are flexed and it gives me the classic, I always say avoid bum bum, two things the same. It actually is bum bum on a bum bum right there. They're too similar. And so I like to break that up. They're, they're just too similar on that. In fact, this one almost looks like it's the relaxed leg. So that's something I would look at there. I would kind of maybe drop that line down a little bit. But I'd definitely bring that breast on for design purposes. And I'd bring that finger on too. See, this looks like a little club. So I would design, always design the index finger at least and the little finger. And then you got something nicer. Maybe push that down a little bit, give the arm that. You know, we've got full agency here. We can, we can do anything we want based on our, our skills and know where everything goes. We can redesign it. You know, I like to push that, that stomach out a little bit to echo what's going on here. A million little choices. This little populate muscle here, it's very feminine. 
know what's what's feminine that that pushes out less so on a man practically not so find out what's feminine find out for a female figure you want to be feminine and find out what is masculine and then you can see what's a man or a woman in in a silhouette and then everything's action you have to learn that for animation you have to be able to see what someone looks like in silhouette so long calf for a female figure all these things and you can read that from a silhouette but lovely stuff there i'm rambling too much uh laura did that help it's a lot <laughs> excellent well let's have a look at some more before i run out of time i think i'm already out of time <gasps> Melody. we'll leave that to the end. leave that to the end can of worms officially opened and let's have a look at chuck chuck is just coming on so fast it's terrifying actually <laughs> it's a scary thing to see at how much evolution exponentially is happening with with chuck it's almost like AI. You know, AI doubles its intelligence every every second. Chuck's like that. I'm not talking about your intelligence. Not, Chuck. not in my no, not in that department. <laughs> Talk about your ability. I'm trading that. I'm losing <laughs> the intelligence. Uh, <laughs> this I is brilliant. <laughs> this is brilliant. But look at all these. Oh, it's so brilliant, Chuck. It's so great. Look at it. So look I wonder this. this is a yeah. for a painting. So this is like a drawing for a painting. And yeah. So one of the things I want to ask is, is there anything you, uh, do you do that? Do you do charcoals for, for painting? Yeah. I, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Anything to think about in this stage for the painting? Yeah. Well, this is the great stage to iron it all out. So, you, you know, I, I used to work with a bunch of guys and they go, why are you doing a, a color rough and a pencil rough and all that business? You know, there's times running out. But what happened was when I had those two things done and started the painting, my painting would just go like that. And I would be whistling as well. And I would leave the studio while they're still working, chewing gum and whistling off into the sunset because I had shortened the time of the painting by taking the time to do the studies. Because if you try and work it all out at the painting stage, you're going to just correct errors all the way through and you're going to be frustrated. Whereas I was just shooting the breeze all the way through the end. Oh, I'm going to take this. When I get into the painting, oh, I'm going to really exploit the thickness of that adductor movement there. Oh, I can't wait. I'm going to go in that push. Maybe I'll push that in the painting. Maybe I'll push that into the great trochanter there. Maybe I'll go up high in the hip here, you know, in the painting. You know, when we push this, let me have a look at this one, actually. Chuck, I would say one thing. I would watch that we, that, that this leg doesn't seem to be coming forward of, of that knee. I would watch that. So maybe, Chuck, mm -hmm. I know you you and Laura have got a conspiracy theory going on that there's no band of Riche. Here's <laughs> your moment. Here's your moment to show that that leg is standing up and this one's coming forward. The band of Riche is going to do that. So as I was drawing, if I was drawing this, I would say that knee is too hard. That's a knee that's coming at us. That's a knee that's doing that. So I would soften that entire knee in here ruffle it up in there and have i got a knee to show i think i have because i have hecate which you've bought chuck i have hecate in here somewhere let's see where is she there there we go look at all that look at that band of roche in there now it is subtle that's why we don't we maybe think it doesn't exist how subtle it is just coming in there it's giving that lovely rhythm within here but we're not seeing the top of the knee because it's a locked foot and same here you know that's going back and it's a diff different drawing from you because none of these legs are, are bent they're both actually quite straight but they're going back one's going back one's coming forward so that ice cream cone idea there's the big dollop right there we're looking down on it so we're seeing more of the top of the patella and then we've got the nose of the tibia here so just right there, ice cream cone. And this is me burying all the technique. You know what it's like when we're in drawing, we do an actual ice cream cone kind of mnemonic, and that's the cone. And then there's a double scoop almost in here, depending. So with women, you're going to see the band of Richet, whether you believe it or not, 
whether we landed on the moon and people jumped off that spaceship with bands of Rache on their legs. There's a band of Rache. It really exists. And it's mostly seen on the female figure. So get it in. Get your band of Rache in there. What's probably um, annoying is that when you look at these apps, they don't put it in. Hold on. I tell a lie. There it is. What's that then? They're calling it the archiform fascia. So what you get with anatomy models is that they're talking to doctors. And so we're talking to artists. And so Riche was, you know, he drew things as well. So we went, here, there's this thing. We can put it in, design your body like that. And that's the band of Riche. He was a doctor anyway, Dr. Riche. A lot of doctors love to draw. I get them in my workshops all the time. There it is, the band of Riche. I shall hear no more conspiracy about it. It exists. And you might go, well, it doesn't say band of Riche. So, so where does oh. it end? Like on the inside of the legs? It just ties things together. Oh. What was, was What's that? it connected what? to in there? Oh, really? oh, it doesn't well, let's end. isolate it. Oh, it's, it's like it's, connected it's, to another muscle. Yeah. Well, what happens when you get a fascia like this is it sometimes attaches not to bone. And upon your roses, the same thing. They're actually attaching to flesh and muscle. So see these, these muscles that are pulling our lips up. They're not attached to bone. They're only att attached to what's called a node in here. And so it's one of those really weird things. It's one of those odd things where here's something that's not attached. Because if it was attached to bone here, then we would have bones in there. And we wouldn't be able to speak so eloquently. We'd be going, ah, 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 ah. You hear the bones grinding. So it's one of those things. It's just, it's tying things up. It's like, I'll just wrap this up for you, sir. You know, like a fish. And there's lots of things like that. And that's the reason why if you go up to the upper limb here and you look at the clavicle, it's actually quite flat. See it? What makes it look round when it gets to here is all of the fascia and all the tendinous links and everything that's wrapped around there. It's all wrapped up in all of this other stuff that keeps us tied together. So it's not, we're not just bones rattling around. And that's what makes it that round shape. So at the end of the day, when we're just warm food, we are just a bunch of bones. And that's why bones fall apart. You just end up all over the place. Dogs run away with your femur. Because all the other stuff the worms had, all the tenderness. It's Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> we can do it. So that would be my tip there, Chuck, is to soften that hard knee. That would be what I'd do there. But it's a marvelous looking thing. I might, even though we've got and uh, we've got perspective here. I might bring that arm down a little bit. Just something to look at, Chuck. And maybe put the hand on here. It's a big call. It's a lot to do. It's just that that junction feels quite um, tight. It seems like a lot of stuff going on in that junction. Uh, it's like I say, everything I say is just advice. What I would do. This is what I would be flagging as I go along maybe clear that up because but i do love how the arm's going back in space i really love that i think it adds a lot of dimension to it maybe bring it down a touch and back and forth so it's always you know push it till it breaks and then pull back that's when i do an animation and then pull back once it looks like it's it's over corrected pull it back and you'll get something sweet in the middle a little sweet thing uh, maybe a bit more um, bone on the finger as well. Watch it doesn't get too soft. But, you know, I can give all this to Chuck because he's so advanced that this is micro stuff now. We're looking at micro stuff. Pushing that, maybe bring that arm. Now that we've looked at that tendon, we don't want it to be too masculine, but maybe show a little bit of that tendon perhaps. Maybe a touch. want to bring that, that down a little bit more. Feels like it needs more on that. And yeah, oh, so this arm's coming forward, Chuck. I felt it was going back a little bit. So let's see. Yeah, I would probably bring that arm away from the body a little bit more. I think that's what we need to do. Maybe not that much, but I want to see that bicep coming forward and then the forearm coming forward. At the minute, it's it's kind of just static. And then the forearm's coming forward. Whereas this has got a lovely dynamic to it, where the arm is definitely going back and then the forearm's coming forward. But they're just ideas, Chuck. I mean, it's such a beautiful thing. I mean, you've got nothing to worry about with all this, all this anatomical knowledge. It's, it's just wonderful, you know? But it's that leg that's bothering me the most. And I'd probably overlap this. 
uh, yeah, this leg seems to be in front of that leg. I want this leg in front. So I'd probably make sure that calf overlaps there. Once you get the band of Roche in, and that's not so hard edged, it'll show better, I think. Yeah, it's just that leg is the is the most uh, troublesome thing I see. She's terrific. Great attitude to her. Could we possibly take that head? Let's see. Would you have more attitude if we did that? Just little ideas. Maybe, you know? Anything that's a tilt gives it a little bit more rhythm. Back to the asymmetry again. Asymmetrical stuff. It's wonderful, Chuck. Any last questions? I better wrap it up soon. No, thank you. This is this is fantastic. That's great. Thanks for bringing it in too, Chuck. I was just I just wanted a few pieces and see if I could talk. Oh dear. See if oh until we get to there. Let's have a look at Rachel. We'll do these two and then we'll do the price. Uh, so, Rachel, Melanie, are there any questions and before we get into uh, Rachel stuff here? I don't think so. Nothing in there? No. The, sh the shy. Uh, people enjoying the, the live stream. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, yeah. And on that, I'm going to do another spruik. So people that, you know, with my workshop, you know, it's it's for the fearless. The fearless come into the workshop and we, we bash it out every week. You remember what it was like. Wonderful, isn't it? It's wonderful to get in with a community of artists and just bash it all out and come out the end of it all fueled with creativity. What I've opened now is the auditorium. And so basically I've got a class running at the minute, but you can go in at any time to the auditorium and just sit and watch, just like this live stream at a big discounted price. And so the auditorium is based on that idea that you're in the workshop watching it from the, the, the gallery. And there it is there. These are Australian dollars, by the way. People ask all the time, is that American? Australian dollars I looked the other day they're always weak. The Australian dollar is one to sixty-four cents. One dollar is sixty-four cents. We're just we may as well call it a peseta. We are we are so why is our currency so low? But it suits you guys. For every dollar you're only spending sixty-four cents. At the minute, anyway. Of course, that's that's in flux. So if you come in, <clears throat> so if you come in here, you get to see the workshop. And remember, the Fantasy Female Figures course is totally different. Everything is different in the in this store. Everything. It's all a whole different thing. And you'll meet me in the auditorium. There I am. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an okay guy. No, I'm not threatening. Am I? Am I threatening? Hardly. I don't, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel threatened. No threat. So I try to make it, a, a, you know... An amiable place where you can come in and feel part of the art community. That's what I want to do. I just want to make sure that we're all growing. If I had this when I was younger, it would have been the times when I would sit in that dark, dank bed sit and just contemplate my sock with the hole and the big toe coming out of it and say, is this ever going to get better? And not realizing that all over the world, there was other people contemplating their toe hanging out of their sock. And now we don't have to do that. We can all get together and we can all grow together as artists. So it's a hard old road being an artist. And we certainly don't want to be alone doing it, which I did. And a lot of us do. I cry in Patrick tears. You now it's been a wonderful experience. But I'd like it not to be that tough at the start for everybody. And there's the auditorium. Then you come, watch the students uh, as they work their way through the course. And then you get a big discount off the course if you want to take the course as well. So as this course is running right now at the moment, it's in week two, it'll populate with movies every week and Q&As from the students. So I just had my first Q&A yesterday and it was great. And, and Chris was there, Chris Deere that you heard that is coming to fix my peelings. Uh, he's in there. There's three Chris Chris's in there. That's why I had to say about Jordan. There's always like three to th throw me off. Three Chris's in the class at the moment. And I kept, I kept it now. That's it now. It's 10. I'm not, I even put it in the store. I tell um, I tell Squarespace that once it's 10, it's over. So that's it. It's boutique now. There's only 10 persons in the class. And then you have to join the auditorium. So when you see the uh, early bird special come up, take it. It'll, it'll fill out really fast. And also it'll go to the auditorium people as a first call as well. So if you're in the auditorium, you get to come into the class at a big discount. 
a 20% off, something like that. I can't remember what it is, but a big discount. And also the Anatomy Style class has a 20% discount for you guys with a code forever of everything that I create after that, 20% off. So I'll try and be as good as I can, try to be the good guy as much as I can, and still be able to, as Rachel asked last week, shod my shoes. Because we need to have shoes to work with. We have to walk out into the street. And I've got, we've got bindi eye here, which is grass with spikes in it. I need to have shoes. So I can only give so much discount before my shoes need to be shot again. So there's I do the best I can to keep it uh, affordable and grow a community. There's where we are. That's what's happening right there. Oh, and at, at the minute, there's a Halloween special on, which is 20% off until the 2nd of November. All you have to do is go on the store. Why did I forget to do this? All you have to do is go on the store, buy anything that's downloadable, and write in the coupon code, Spooked. That's not, is that how you spell spooked? It is. I think so. Isn't yeah. it? Just write in spooked and you'll get 20% off anything you like. Okay, that's the end of my. Should I have left that there? <laughs> what a salesman. <laughs> spooked. I'll leave it there for a bit. I, I just didn't want to destroy Rachel's lovely art. I'm not going to do it. You just got to remember spooked. Who can't remember that? <laughs> All right. Now. Rachel's been creating wonderful stuff on Patreon. See the link below. And I'll add you there as well, Laura. Uh, anyone who comes in gets a link below. <clears throat> so follow Rachel on her Patreon Odyssey. There's beautiful stuff in there right now. Now, uh, Moth and Spike are in there. Is that the right order? Or is it Spike yeah. and Moth? Yeah, Moth and Moth Spike, and Spike uh, a comic I'm working on. <laughs> Tell us something about it, Rachel. I'll tell you some about it. Yeah. Uh, it's it's got... the elevator pitch. <laughs> well, I sort of started making up this little world, and I'm just seeing where it goes. And currently, I'm at about 60 pages of a comic, wow. which people seem to be responding positively to. So I guess it's all right. <laughs> and uh, we'll see where it goes. I, I have like a rough draft written out for like, 10 chapters and i'm hoping to hit like 300 pages in the next year or two and we'll yeah. see I'll, I'll i'll try to write, round out the story there but we'll Fantastic. see where it goes <laughs> i salute you okay <laughs> it's my first yeah. attempt at like building something like my own story i've illustrated other people's stuff yeah to like build my own world it's a, uh, it's fun <laughs> well you wouldn't think it rachel because it looks like you have been a professional storyteller forever and you you have been. I bet you were the I bet you were the storyteller at camp. I bet when we were all <laughs> on the campfire, you were scaring people with scary stories. That's what I guess. That's my guess. Maybe I, I think people are scared of me for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another What's podcast. Wrong with me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a look at how wonderful this is. So look at the beauty of these wonderful. First of all, the anatomy is fantastic. Look at that. Boom. A lesser artist would just do that. Fantastic. Because it seems like, and the reference is just, it's just that. But it ain't. Why can't I change that? Let's have a look why. So in the reference, it looks like it's just that. But we know, don't we, everyone in this room, that there's a three-finger gap there. There's a crest of a hip going around here. There's a great trochanter bone in here. And we need to get down to that great trochanter bone and wrap around. So we have a square female figure. And we have a rond male figure. So the more rond the gluteus is, the more male it looks. How bizarre. Who would have thought? And it's the truth. Okay. And we also have tilt. So I would tilt that more too. I would tilt that, push that out. So we're always redesigning. That's how we do it as artists. And I would probably pull that scapula out too. I want to feel that turn in there. I want to feel that rib cage and that turn. I would do that. I would add like this to get that rhythm. She's always already given us this beautiful sternocleidomastoid curve, but we push that, push it more. We have that. We can see the ovoid head to the untrained eye. Of course, that looks like a square head because of the haircut. And we've got the head almost square on. So not much to worry about there. 
So there we are. We've got lots of decisions to make. I'd probably thicken that a little bit, push up just to get more rhythm, probably add more height to that rectus femoris. So we're just talking about, and that's Uber. When I do a big turn like that, it is to show you the biggest idea of it. And of course, you make that a little bit more subtle, just to show you what I'm thinking. Let's see what Rachel did. All, everything I would hope for. Look at, there it is, three finger gap, that beautiful rectus femoris, that beautiful thickness there. Oh, and that little link to the, to the fibularis bone. So beautiful, and that lovely wistful look. Oh, that's lovely. So look what Rachel's done. She's made a more ovoid, a more heart-shaped face there to give it that little nymph look to it. Wonderful. Now, what I would say, Rachel, there's only one thing that, that I'm looking at, it, and it's that shoulder maybe pushed a bit too broken. You know, we push it till it breaks. I would probably bring that down a little and bring the breast out maybe so that the arm comes behind it just to give it a bit more readability. That would be probably the only two things I would adjust on that. And not much more. Maybe we'd take the, let's take the head. Let's have a look at the head. I'm recording this. Yeah, it records self, doesn't it? <laughs> so this will go up later, I hope. I don't know. So I'd probably take that, Rachel, and just have a play with it and see if it maybe is a little, needs a little bit more work. Let's see. Maybe just that. Just a touch. Those little things. So that's the great thing about, you know, hashing it out, show it to your fellows. You never know where you went off base. And a fresh eye will just show you right away. Fresh eye will, will give you that information immediately. And that's the great thing about, you know, being a cohort of artists together. We can all help each other when we get too close to the art. I think uh, this one I got stuck on. Uh, I still see like that. There's like a, I hit like a bit of a tangent with the elbow and the belly button, and, I, and that area uh, with the shadow down there, and it just got too dark and muddy, so I, I stopped. But uh, it still bothers me. Quite yeah, well, it might be a, it might be a place to just to just mass it. Yeah, just don't worry about that belly button. Yeah, that's what I should. We have done. Yeah, we don't have to to uh, we don't have to spell everything out, you know. The face is everything. Remember Norman Rockwell, if the, if the hands and face are fine, then everything else is fine. You know, everything else is just butter. It's just all in the mix. So I'd probably flesh out that, that back just a touch there and then see if I can get the groove into it. Get it in the groove and see how I, I pull away from the art. So I, I always suggest that the students, they get in too close. They're like this. They're all about digital. And so they want to get all the details in. Basically, ego again. Not you, Rachel. This is brilliant. So I will square off that scapula if I can. But zoom in out gives you a, a cleaner read on it. So that gives you a clearer read on everything. Of course, you can go in there and micro fix it. I'm just doing a big blast on it just to feel it. So yeah, those those little fixes there is what I would be looking at to just make that a little bit more dreamy and less a little bit clunky in the mechanics showing a little bit like you say you were hooked up on that belly button and what happens is you start getting focused on something that you think is wrong and then you feel everything's wrong when really you just go that belly button it's bothering me well then just sfumato it out and throw the ego away because you don't have to explain your belly button oh where's the belly button well if you're concerned with the belly button pal you know, you're concerned with something that doesn't make any sense. I want to see all the toes. Well, it doesn't really matter because you're taken away from the story. Everyone's wiggling their toes at the front to prove they can draw toes. Then we don't see the story. The picture's gone. We're, we're all caught up in some 60s clown. That's from Seinfeld. <laughs> Guy says, what do you mean you don't know Bonzo the clown? He says, hey, man, you're all caught up in some 60s clown. And it was a good way to, because he was a clown for a living. And he couldn't understand he didn't know him. So, you know, the clown was right. Just, I don't have to know Bozo the clown. I, I can be a new clown. Rachel, be a new clown. I'll do my <laughs> best. <laughs> mix metaphors. See what happens when you mix metaphors? You don't know what the hell you're talking about anymore. 
So let me unmix them. Basically, don't worry about a belly button. It It's a big showy piece. And if it shows some rhythm, put it in. I love it. If it's taken away from the rhythm, take it out. Do anything you please. And that's going to be a lovely, lovely piece. Uh, I didn't even take the question. Any advice for watercolor painting? Is there any questions in the chat, Rachel, before I take that question? We're going to uh, wrap up. I don't minutes. think so. Not that I see. So, Rachel, is this actual watercolor on watercolor paper? Yeah, I got this new sketchbook, and I'm just kind of testing out the paper, really. But oh, look. It's, uh, this, this German brand sketchbook. Yeah. But it's like kind of like Molstein. I like it. Yeah. Can and, we see uh, it again? Rachel, can you hold it up again, please? Yeah. Because I want to show you all how beautiful traditional work is. Look at that. <laughs> That's a treasure. You know, people will treasure that forever and ever and ever. And they'll look at it and they'll go up, they'll get the most, they'll smell the paper. There's nothing like it. You know, it's the most wonderful thing. You know, warts and all, even if it wasn't your best piece ever, it doesn't matter. You know, it's there. It's a Rachel. Yeah. Owens. It's a Rachel Owens and it's it's forever collectible. I'm excited because, about this sketchbook. <laughs> yeah, me too. I can't wait to see the rest of it. With watercolor, I would say let the watercolor do what it likes. Don't try and control it too much. And so what I used to do with watercolor is I would lay down a big wet wash with a brush inside these lines. So I would have the pencil drawing and I would I would fill this with water right to the edges. And so what you have is just basically a sheen of water where maybe up to that arm, for instance, and then put some paint in it, put this gray in it and let it spread a little bit. Let it dry first, though, a touch. You know, it depends what you want. If you put the, the paint in right away, it's going to go everywhere. And it's going to be a fabulous effect. But if you're trying to control it somewhat, then let it almost dry. Keep looking at it. It's still got a sheen. Drop a little bit of, of watercolor in it and let it flow a little. And then you'll get this beautiful organic thing that you can push around a little bit. But the minute it starts to set, stop. That is my advice for watercolor. Let the watercolor do what it likes to a degree. And if you try and push it, then you'll continue pushing it. And before you know it, it's no longer a watercolor. It's a gouache painting. So gouache, it'll look like a gouache painting. Watercolor is beautiful. Everyone loves it. And if they're going to buy a watercolor, they want it to look like a watercolor. And it's gorgeous. And it'll save you a lot of grief too. When I started trying to control watercolor, so I was working in advertising, and my agent would come in. I had a lot of portfolios. I was the man of many styles. And my agent would go, we want a sophisticated cartoon. I knew exactly what she meant. She meant not Bugs Bunny, even though it's sophisticated. She meant it's for a bank. It's for a corporate bank. And what they wanted was art. And so I'd go, okay. So I'd draw a businessman or a business you know, person. And, and I would let the watercolor flow. And then they would get it. And they would go, wow, I could put that on my wall, even though it's a, it's a cartoon. And that was a sophisticated cartoon. And what it meant was, once the drawing was locked in, once they said yes to the drawing, I knew I could do that in 15 minutes. Just go bloop, 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 and sit back with a coffee and watch it and see what it does. And then hand it off to them. And they loved it every single time. And if I ever tried to control it, they sent it back and says, because they started to see that it was getting tight. And they'd go, oh, could it be a bit tighter here? So they started to tighten up what they thought you hadn't finished. And so if it was all loose, they went wonderful because it was it was in concert with everything else. There's art and there's everything else. Nothing else is like art. You can do a completely tight drawing if you want. But that's my advice for watercolor. Let it okay. run. Let it play. You'll be astounded how beautiful it is and how much more watercolor you want to do. So when I used to do them. They'd give me six to do and I'd go... One, two, three, four, and watch them all play. <laughs> and then once again, waltz off into the sunset with my chewing gum and think the world is great. So that's my advice. Okay. I'll be an inter interested to see what you do. Yeah. I'm trying to do more watercolor. So <laughs> yep. uh, we'll see how it goes. Do it, Rachel. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful Sweet. world, watercolor. It really is. And it's great for studies too. You know, you can do them quite quickly and get a good feel for the oil painting to come perhaps. Yeah. And I don't advocate really acrylic. I think oils are the king of paints because you can do a watercolor technique an acrylic technique or an oil technique all within oils, but you can't do it with anything else. 
But what watercolor does is it gives you the same pigment that's in the oils with a different binder. And so you've already got the feel of the colors. So, you know, an ultramarine blue and an ultramarine blue oils and watercolor, it's the same, it's the same pigment, different binders. So you've already got the colors in your heart. You've already got that for the next stage. Whereas acrylic, not so much. It's a plastic based paint and it hasn't got that. And here's the thing about acrylics. And I'm not demonizing them, by the way, guys. They're great, very fast. I used them for 15 years. They said they were forever. And they've just discovered in the Metropolitan Museum in New York that Andy, Andy Warhol's plastic paint, his acrylic paintings, that's what he was famous for, are starting to deteriorate. They said they were forever. And oh, what the hell? How could they even give that claim out when they... Only does they only invented it in the 60s. So how could they make that claim? And sure enough, it's fallen apart. We thought it was forever. It's it's not. There's a bit of art history for you. All right, so let's have a look in and plastic dresses too. They're falling apart. Plastic ain't fantastic. All right, so we have, let's see, we're gonna open the bomb now. Let's have a look. Here we go. Now, Melanie. What a beautiful pencil drawing. Oh, I love it. I could put that on the wall and look at it forever. This is interesting. What's this, Melanie? Don here. Incredible. The AI machine. I'm glad you put this at the bottom three. Digital drawing used as AI as reference. Before the war starts, put the caveat in. AI rendered, say that fast. AI rendered using VizCom. Digital drawing using AI as reference before we get into the, the button fight. Now, it ain't going away. It's not going away. And it's amazing. Now, you found something, didn't you, Rachel? Was it the same one that you put your sketch into? Is this the same one? Yeah. Sketch? It's an AI that uh, Scott Robinson's been working on, VizCom.ai. Yeah. You just throw a drawing into the thing, and it renders it for you. And you can draw in the program, too. No. No, so. that's exciting. That's yeah, exciting. It's crazy. It's a, it's supposed to be for like cars and industrial design, but obviously it can render human forms too. Yeah. And uh, it, it cannot understand like cartoons though. Like anything yeah. more abstract, it doesn't get it. It just does weird things. Well, I'm glad to see it because it's it's really dispelling that fear that like I've been talking with Steven Zapata recently, and there's a class action going against uh, the AI companies that aren't crediting the artists or paying the artists that it's all been mined from, scraped from. But what you have here, as far as I can see, is an ink being scraped. You're putting down a pencil drawing and it, it evolves the art from your drawing, which means there's only one creator, you, and the AI is an assist. That's Nirvana. And so hopefully this is it. This is where we need to be. And then that that kills all of that fear of... You know, you don't have to put that big red band on no more AA art because it is your art. And you just had an assistant, this thing that should be helping us all. It isn't going away. And so we have to find either an ethical way to use it where the artist is compensated or something like this, where there's only one creator and an assist, which is the AI. I'm very excited about this. I am going to have another look at this. So wonderful. So you, you drew... Let me get this right. Digital drawing using AI as reference. So you took this sketch, Melanie. Is that correct? And it made this, and then you drew that from that. Is that correct? Is that the correct, method? Yeah, correct. Oh, wonderful. So really, you own this too. This is you too, because there was no other, there was no other hand in it. I don't know where they're going to get off. Maybe from a three D model. I hope so. But basically, we're there now, with what we want. We want an AI based on the artist's hand. So I'm very excited by that. Let's see if the chat just blew up. Has anyone got an opinion in the Q&A about what we're looking at here? Seems what like people are just watching. <laughs> just watching? Maybe they're too frightened yeah. to come out of the bunker. Come yeah. out of the bunker, guys. It's, it's a safe <laughs> place. Well, I'm very excited. Can you tell us, uh, Melanie and Rachel, where you, you can get this thing? Uh, just go to vizcom.ai. It's uh, fun to play around with. If nothing else, it's free. Um, it's free yeah you can render one thing at a time for free if you want to use it like professionally i guess you pay for it you can render like four things at a time um, all right yeah I, I was digging into it a lot 
like for a couple yeah. of weeks. <laughs> oh, great. See, when I started off at 20 something years old, I started off 16, 17, I was doing professional work. But when I was really boots and all in, in my early 20s, the the cream of the work that I was getting, because my skills weren't high enough to get the big, big agents and the big money, were basically what I, AI does, which is just a quick brand, a quick logo, a quick something or other that an agency can take and go, good enough, that's fine. Great, we'll use that. Like I say, a lot of teddy, I don't know why, a lot of teddy bears in armor. I don't know how many of those you can sell and who wants them, but that's what I see a lot of when I look through Mid Journey teddy bears in armor. Who started that? There's some different ones. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. But yeah, that's the problem with it. It doesn't have a mind. And like someone said, there's no Mid Journey. You have the idea and then you get the end result with nothing in the middle. There is no Mid Journey. So that's the problem of spitting these things out. It has no idea what they are, but we do. We know what they are. And that's why this is exciting. It's just, It really is truly astonishing. And that's why I believe that learning to draw is still the essential skill. Because we have that thought process. We learn how to learn. And this thing is just spitting out what other people have learned. And at the end of the day, it's all going to look the same. And here we are back to square one again. There's a pool of people that know how to learn how to be creative. And they're going to stand out. No matter where, you're going to stand right out, right out of the crowd. That's why there's only one Craig Mullins and then everyone else. And then you'll find another person, Sparth maybe. And then there's everyone else. I haven't seen Sparth for a long time. But that was always the way of it. We had this concept art of photo bashing and everything looked the same. And then you get one guy comes in and he's a great thinker, creator, illustrator, artist. Why does it look so great? Does he get lucky with every photo he finds? No, he's got the skills that we have, which is how to draw, how to think. Amazing skills. And what you guys have here. Wonderful. So and praise of Melanie at the end. What a lovely drawing here and here. And what a fascinating middle that is. I wonder what we're going to see next. Fantastic. Love it, Melanie. Is there anything you would like me to help you with? Because I, it's so stylish and beautiful. I say that with just maybe one thing in there, I think that's that's good. I, I think that's good to go, and I would hardly change a thing. Now, I'm going to ask you, Melanie, what do you think I was going to delete? Is what, my, you're going to delete? Yeah, I'm going to delete something and see if it, if it helps. What do you think that, that would be? I feel like it's going to be somewhere... In the shoulder area you're absolutely right <laughs> see we're thinkers and we're creators so i would probably go in here and i might say does that read better like this that's what i would say in fact does it read better if we take it right to the profile any one of those things i'm looking at right now now i love the flow of the hair but i feel that it's taken it's it's too much story and that's plenty story right there I love the idea that the hair is blowing in the wind, but still, you know, if and dot take it out is something I sort of ascribe to because I don't like dot. And I like to fly like I'm a pantser, fly by the seat of my pants, but I really feel that stronger with thought. That's what I'm I do like with. it a lot better without actually. <laughs> so, that's what mm -hmm. I would say. And that's what's great when you're with your peers. We're all in the same boat and it's a leaky boat. So we got to all go in there and help each other, you know, fix the leak. I'm going for another metaphor. I've, I've tripped over five today. Somebody has to be fixing that leaky boat all the way while you're there. Go on, Melanie. We'll fix any leaks that come out. Take out the hair. All right. Okay. That's what we can do. We can help each other that way. Now, I'm going to wrap it up with the prize. I spun that dial and a, a name come up. And then, like I say, it's the more lottery tickets. Chuck. Congratulations. You are the proud owner of this artwork. Oh. All fair and square. All fair and square. No matter what the peanut gallery says, you, your name was there. It was like lots of lots of chucks, and I, I hit one. You so just posted about how you couldn't afford one of Patrick's paintings on Instagram. Did you say that, Chuck? Is that a true story? Yeah. Well, there's a... I'm <laughs> you put it out there. There you go. There you go. 
All right, Chuck, congratulations with that. I'll take any uh, questions now. <laughs> I know you'll treasure it, Chuck. Thanks. Thanks for your uh, thanks for your, your support and everything I do and everyone in this room. I couldn't do it without you. So last call, anyone that has any questions, and I will upload this as a recording uh, tomorrow uh, or sometime during the week. Anything to play out? I don't last? think so. Do you, you plan on doing more of these podcasts? I want to do one a month. Thanks, Rachel. And like I say, check the descriptions down below for everyone in this room. And I'll add you that to that, Laura. Anyone who comes into the workshop, I'll put it in the in the description. So, um, yeah, I'm going to do one a month, I think, if you guys still want to do it. If you want to, we'll call it the alumni or something. That's yeah. the first thing I hooked on to. <laughs> and we can do that and maybe call it something. Like the one I'm going to do with these homie hangouts is called, that's uh, just a, a name, the art agents. And the idea is that we have agency over our art. We no longer need an agent. We are the agents. An agency just means that you're in control of something. So I was thinking of doing a podcast called The Art Agents. And it would be those guys. And I'd be that, like I say, I'm I'm old school and they'd be new school. And we would sit together and we would talk about how do we take agency? How do we grow as artists and become prosperous as artists without having to lean on the giant machine? that we always needed. You know, we always needed an agent. We needed a publicist. We needed whatever we needed. Uh, we needed the cowtail to another organization to get work. How can we be like Rachel and have Moth and Spike? How can we be you like... You don't want to be like... <laughs> how can we? How can we be independent artists that are in charge of our future? How can we do it? I'm well, still we asking that. <laughs> well, that's this maybe this new podcast. Yeah, podcast. I think I need some wisdom. <laughs> well, we will take, we will take agency. That's the okay. party. So that's that's one uh, idea that we're going to have. And I was thinking that I would interview, you know, artists that I admire, famous artists. You know, uh, like try to find Jim Steranko the other day. And he's a mystery man. He always was. He's an escape artist. Try and find Jim Steranko. I'll probably ask uh, as publisher. I know him, uh, and see if I can get uh, maybe Forrest and Julie on. Forrest and Julie, if you're watching, it'd be great to interview you. Uh, friends, that'd be really cool. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. So those kind of things. So it would be different playlists. That's that's the idea that I'm I'm thinking of. So yes, the answer, Rachel. Yes, I think YouTube is. It cuts out the noise. All right, guys. I'm gonna pull the plug. I'm trying to remember what I do. I think I stopped the live stream first. So I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone in the live stream. Uh, so thanks, guys. Oh, look at all those comments. How wonderful. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you coming in there. That's such a nice, nice thing to see. But unfortunately, I'm going to end the stream. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say goodbye to you. But it's been wonderful. And I'll see you next month. All right. So you guys just hang there for a second. And I'll say goodbye to everyone. Uh, see you guys in the stream. And it's a three, two, one from us. And it's been a joy. Okay. And there we go.